Hey everyone, I hope you're having a great 4th of July weekend, celebrating and having a good time, enjoying being outside. Um, uh, we, we've got a long summer ahead of us, lots to look forward to. I hope it's been good to you so 
far. We've really enjoyed the, the good weather and all of that. And the, this is one of my favorite weekends of the year. Um, I want to kick us off today with reading uh, from Psalm 96, just to kind of frame our worship. Here's what it says. Psalm 96, verse 1 says, Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord and praise his name. Proclaim, uh, proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among the peoples. When we praise and we sing worship songs, it's not just about singing songs that make us feel good. It's not just for our benefit. We're actually declaring who God is and, and singing his praises so, so that the world will know. Uh, just who he is. There actually is something spiritually that happens when we begin to sing songs of praise, songs of honor to God that shifts, shift things. Here's what it goes on to say. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For the, all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. I love that. Uh, the, the fear of the Lord, that can sometimes be confusing. It doesn't mean that we cower in fear. It means that there is a reverence or a holy awe for who God is. It's something that pa makes you pause and stops in your tracks. So because God is to be feared, because he's awesome, because he's beautiful and he is full of strength and glory, he's worthy to be feared. He's worthy to be stood, the kind of, for us to stand up in awe of him. Ascribe to the Lord, it says in verse 7, all you families of the nations, that's you. Every person who is watching this right now, whether you're single or whether you're with your family, ascribe to the Lord. So give to the Lord, you families of the nations, Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. So tell him how great he is. Tell him how good he is. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. So we're supposed to proclaim who he is. The world, the world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. He will judge the, the, judge the peoples with equity. Then I love how this ends. So it just talks about how we fear the Lord, how we should have this reverence and awe for him because of how awesome he is. And then I love how this ends. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea resound in all that's in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let all the trees of the forest sing for joy. Let all of creation rejoice before the Lord for he comes. He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the people in his faithfulness. I love this, how along with the fear of the Lord, this reverence and this awe is this call for us to have joyful celebration of who God is. Oftentimes we think when we're in that reverent awe, it's sober and it's serious. But right here, just a couple verses later, he's actually saying, no, you should rejoice. You should be singing with joy for how good God is. We should sing for joy for what God is about to do on the earth. I'm coming today to worship with a hopeful expectation of God doing good things in your life and in my life. So I'm ready to worship in the fear of the Lord. I'm ready to worship and rejoicing in who he is. And I hope that you'll join us in, uh, in that today as well. So I'm going to pray for us and then let's just worship together, church. Heavenly Father, I thank you for who you are, and I thank you for how incredibly majestic and beautiful and strong and kind and merciful you are. God, there just aren't enough words to describe your greatness and your beauty. And I pray, Lord, that today as we worship, Lord, that you would impress upon our minds just how incredible you are, Lord, that you are worthy of worship. You are worthy to be praised, God. So we just want to lift your name up high from our living rooms or wherever we're watching this. God, I pray that, that today you would be glorious glorified and honored in our praise and our worship, Lord. Let your spirit come to every house as we lift up your name high. And I pray that you would shift atmospheres in homes, Lord. Help our minds and our hearts to be refreshed in worship today as we lift up the name of Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's worship. Father of kindness, you have poured out grace. You've brought me out of darkness, you've filled me with peace. Giver of mercy. 
mercy, oh my help in time of need. Lord, I can't help but see. Faithful you are. Faithful forever you will be. Faithful you are. All your promises are yes and amen. All your promises are yes and amen. Oh, beautiful Savior, you've brought me near. You've pulled me from the ashes, you've broken every curse. Blessed Redeemer, you have set this cat to free. Lord, I can't help but see. All your promises are yes and amen. All your promises are yes and amen. Faithful you are. Faithful forever you will be. Faithful you are. Promises a yes and amen. All your promises a yes and amen. I will rest in your promise. This is my confidence Is your faithfulness I will rest In your promises My confidence Is your faithfulness I will rest In your promises My confidence My confidence yes, it is. Yes. is your faithfulness, faithful you are, faithful forever you will be, faithful you are. Promises a yes and amen. All your promises a yes and amen. So open up to the Lord, 
take communion in just a minute. Uh, if you'd like to take a moment and pause, you can go get crackers and juice or bread or whatever you have on hand to use. 
One of my favorite things about God is how he knows us. He knows us so completely. He knows every corner, every facet of our hearts, every characteristic of our personality, every piece of our mind. Psalm 139 says, Lord, you know everything there is to know about me. You perceive every moment of my heart and soul, and you understand my every thought before it even enters my mind. You are so intimately aware of me, Lord. And the even crazier thing to me is that God doesn't just know us so completely. He loves us completely, even in the midst of knowing us. And that sounds really nice to hear it out loud, but for me, I know there are dark places in me, sinful places that I can't imagine God loving, but he does. He loves each part of me and continuously calls me into who I am, who I truly was made to be in him. And God's love for us, the response he gives to this love and this knowing of us is to send his son. He sent his son to die for us. He sent himself to die for us, to die for our sin, to die for the dark corners of our hearts, to die for the places that, and the ways that we fall short. And it's incredible to me because even in that death, Jesus rose again from the dead. And we celebrate with communion, not just the remembering of the sacrifice Jesus made because God knows us and loves us so well, but because now, because Jesus is alive, he lives in us. His spirit lives in us, not just so God can keep on knowing us and keep on loving us, but so we can know him. He wants to be known fully by us. And so that's what he's calling us into today, not just to receive the love he has to give us and to feel and know that we belong and are known by him, but he wants to call us into a greater knowledge of who he is, of his character and his kindness and his goodness. And so we're going to take communion. You can go ahead and take the elements. Let's sit in gratitude for what he's done. And if you're willing, say yes. God, I want to know you better. Because he wants to show us. He wants to show us more of who he is. darkness, my God, that is who you
Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Oh, we make miracle worker, promise keep. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are.
to let them just keep playing for just a minute. You know, we don't we don't like to just sing songs about Jesus being a healer and a miracle worker. We believe that Jesus actually is those things and that he does those things. And so it's appropriate for us. It's actually more worshipful to him to actually ask him to do those things than just sing those songs about him. So we want to sing those songs, but the king that we're singing about actually is present with us as we're worshiping. And so we're just going to ask him to heal and to restore a few things. So a few things specifically I want to pray for. Uh, felt like maybe there's somebody who's watching who's got a, like kind of like an issue with their gallbladder or like um, something in their digestive tract that's having a hard hard time digesting food. It's been causing you some like ongoing pain. Uh, so I'm just going to pray for that. So in, in the mighty name of Jesus, I just pray for healing over whatever that issue is in the gut that right now that it would be healed, that whatever disease, whatever attack, whatever parasite, whatever's there would just go in the name of Jesus that it would be completely and totally eradicated, that it would be healed right now. Whatever cramping is there, it would just go in the name of Jesus. So also maybe there's someone with the right knee, you're having some like popping or something like that going on in your right knee. It's it's painful uh, and you've been just, uh, just trying to manage it. So in Jesus' name, I pray for healing over that knee right now, um, that, that it would just be healed. It would be fully, fully restored and delivered. So if that's you, you can go ahead and try and move your knee right now. See if there's anything going on. Maybe there's like a, even a little bit of a tingling sensation. So just move, try to move your knee around. Uh, see if that gets better. I also feel like, man, someone is just really being oppressed in their thoughts, a plagued with dark thoughts. It feels like it's something outside of yourself. You can't quite... Um, can't quite rein it in. So I pray in the name of Jesus that those thoughts would go, that there would be a, just a freedom of thinking uh, of things that are lovely and pure and holy and good that would just replace those thoughts that are evil and dark. And they would be, it would go in the name of Jesus, that there would be no night terrors. There would be no, um, no evil, no evil thoughts ongoing in your mind. Just have a clear conscience. Lift off, Lord, anxiety and depression right now. Uh, any assignment from the enemy that would bring, uh, that would bring people depression and anxiety and, and worry that it, that is destructive. I pray that it would go in the name of Jesus, be delivered and healed in the name of Jesus. Everything must bow. So we just pray in the name of Jesus that you would be healed right now, he healed and fully restored. If you have some other physical issue, something I didn't name um, right now that's bothering you on your body or whatever, just put a hand, uh, maybe on whatever's hurting, uh, as long as that's an appropriate thing. Uh, and then you're, and then if you've got family around, even kids, uh, if, if anyone's there, if you just extend a hand towards whoever might be sick or hurting right now, put your hand on their shoulder or whatever, and just pray for their healing right now. So I just pray for deliverance and healing over every ailment, every sickness, every affliction that our enemy would send. In the name of Jesus, go by the authority and the power, by what he did for us on the cross. I pray for absolute deliverance and healing right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Be healed, be healed, be healed, be healed and restored, be healed and restored. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. Thank you, Jesus, for your kindness and your mercy and healing. God, you're so, you're so, so good. Uh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Uh, we would love to hear what God did. If there was any healing, I mean, any movement at all, we would love to continue to pray for that. So just please let us know uh, what God did for you uh, in that. I would love to hear those stories. So it will build my faith up uh, and it will encourage the faith of our community. So go ahead uh, and, and please let us know. Right now, we're going to pass the peace. So go ahead and text someone, call somebody. No, don't call anyone. Just text them. Send them a message letting, letting them know that you miss them, you love them. Go ahead right now and pass the peace. And Mark and Trish, thank you so much. Appreciate you guys so much for being here today and leading us in worship. That was awesome. I wish you could be here in the room. Um, on that note, we do have some good news for you. Um, so right now, uh, our... Um, uh, based off of the, the feedback we're getting from what we can do at Messiah, based off of what's going on here in our region, uh, here in the northwest suburbs of Chicago, uh, we believe that beginning on the first Sunday of August, we will begin to have some outdoor worship services together on Sunday evenings at Messiah. Uh, so we're still working through the details of exactly what that's going to look like and what time that is going to be. But for right now, our plan is for the month of August, and we may even extend into September 
September that we'll be having some outdoor worship services at Messiah starting Sunday evening. So we'll give those details out to you, what that's going to look like, what you ex- what you kind of can expect for kids, because there won't be any uh, like kind of separate kids ministry going on. Uh, but we'll give you some details about what that's going to look like. But we're so excited to be able to worship together on a regular basis uh, in person. So that's going to start hopefully the first Sunday in August, weather permitting and all things being equal. Now, you know, as well as I do, that this the situation with coronavirus is changing. I mean, even this week, even within our school district uh, in Wakanda, we got conflicting pieces of information with a matter of day or two of one another. So so we just don't know. But right now, that's our best. Our best plan is that starting August 1st, we'll do that. And it will shift from that point forward to being a morning worship time. It's back to an evening worship time. We may bump that time back a little bit. We'll let you know about that. But from this point forward, from the beginning of August on, uh, if we're live streaming or whether we're in person, it will be in the evening uh, as as we typically are. So look forward to that. Watch out for the details as far as that. I also want to remind you that we are, for all of our kids, uh, K through, I believe it's sixth grade, We have wind shape camps uh, that we're participating in. So uh, we're trying to get everybody to register and be a part of that on the same week together so that we can experience that together as a church. And if you're comfortable and if you're able, you might even get together with another family, uh, another group of kids to be able to watch those videos together. Uh, I'm hearing really good feedback on what what that is going to look like. So I'm so excited for that for our kids. Um, So I would encourage you to do that as well. Um, We also are going to have another worship night here at the office coming up for you, hopefully here in the next couple of weeks. We'll confirm that date with you just as soon as we can, so, so be watching out for that. Uh, also, just as a reminder, please continue to be giving. Uh, your generosity is just outstanding. I wish that this week uh, I could have um, uh, had, a, had a video camera to see the different ways that we were serving people in our community. So it's not just generosity through giving money. It's generosity through how you're giving and serving our community as well. So uh, that's just so exciting. So keep doing that. Uh, also, we want to remind you, we're still trying to support our friends down in Peru, Oikos community. And so if you have extra money, uh, like especially maybe you've getting, been getting some extra groceries from Faith Acres lately, you you can, you can redirect that directly to Faith Acres, to us, so that it can go into Oikos. Just whatever you can do to increase that, uh, our faithfulness and generosity there, because we just believe that God has given us some great ministry partners in Peru. So that's all I've got for announcements uh, today. Uh, we are going to dig into something new. So I am excited. We are going to be looking at the Lord's Prayer for the next few weeks together. Uh, we're going to learn together how to pray like Jesus. So uh, the disciples came to Jesus one time and they asked him, how should we pray? Basically, Jesus, how do you do it? And he taught them how to pray. And then we also have another record of how Jesus taught his disciples to pray in this famous Sermon on the Mount. And the reason why we're going to press into this together is because I have a strong conviction that prayer is like the minimum responsibility of every believer, every follower of Jesus. And I believe that God is calling our church to be a praying church, to be a a household of prayer. If we look at the book of Acts and we see what the apostles are doing, we see what the disciples and the early followers of of Jesus are doing, they're gathered together and they're praying. Every significant advance of the gospel is preceded by people praying. And it wasn't just the job of the prayer warriors, of the intercessory prayer team. It was the responsibility of every follower of Jesus to know how to pray like Jesus. And so we're going to press in over the next few weeks and look at how did Jesus teach his disciples to pray so that we can be a praying church. And I believe, I believe this with my whole heart, that if you will engage and actually practice the things that we're going to talk about throughout this series, that you will grow deeper in your relationship with God and you'll become more fruitful in your prayer life as well. You'll begin to see some things shift that, uh, that the things that you prayed for before, you'll begin to actually lean a little bit more and you'll begin to see some answers to those prayers. You'll begin to feel more of a deeper connection with God. And we want God to move in our communities, in our neighborhoods, in ways that can only be attributed to prayer. The truth is, anything that we can accomplish in our own strength and our own ability without prayer is actually something that's fleeting and won't last. But the things that we can go 
oh my gosh, do you know, do you see what God did? That those things that were birthed in prayer, those are the things that change and bring transformation to our neighborhoods. Those are the things that change families. So that's why we're pressing in to this prayer. So we're going to look at uh, the Lord's Prayer over the next few weeks. So I'm going to start out right away. Uh, it's Matthew chapter 6, I believe, verse 5, and just go through this little beginning part right here. Here's what it says. Jesus is talking to his disciples, Sermon on the Mount, and here's what he says. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. And then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think that they'll be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So here's where we're going to go today. Uh, we're going to focus in on the Father's character. It's the first thing that Jesus talks about when he actually begins to tell them how they should pray. And here's why. When we understand what God is really like, when we understand who God really is, it will help us to know how to uh, approach God, how to have the right posture in approaching God, and it will help us to begin to have the right priorities in prayer. So we're going to hold those two things in tension. What's the posture that we should have in approaching God in prayer? And then what it should be our priority in prayer? And it's all going to be related to understanding who God is. And so Jesus, as he begins to unpack this thing about prayer, starts out with kind of, um, he, he wants his disciples to know, this is how you pray. Now, let me just say right from the beginning that Jesus didn't mean, I want you to repeat these words exactly and no more. It certainly means we should include the words that he issues here in the prayer. But this has been used by, by some different traditions to say this is the only prayer that we should pray because it's the only way that Jesus taught uh, his disciples to pray. But we have examples of other times where Jesus prayed different words. So clearly he's not saying these are the only words that you should say. He's saying this is kind of the, the invitation. This is how I want you to know how I approach prayer with my father. I want you to think about that for a second. Like we are getting an intimate window into Jesus's relationship with his heavenly father. He's saying, look, when I go away and I pray with the father, this is how I do it. And that is an incredible thing. I like to, to be on a front row to understand Jesus. How is it that you do the things that you do? And he says, well, this is how I connect with my father. But in order to teach us how to do that, he starts out by contrasting how you shouldn't pray. So Jesus says, look, here's how you shouldn't do it. Don't pray this way. And so what he does, and he contrasts how he prays with these kind of extreme religious examples. So the first one he says is, don't pray like the hypocrites. He says, look, here's what you shouldn't do. You shouldn't be the kind of person who goes out and prays on the street corner uh, in a really loud voice for everyone to be able to see. But in fact, you're not actually praying to God. You're not trying to move the heart of God. You're actually trying to move people around you to think of you in a different way. And he says, when that's your aim, when you're trying to impress people, then that's all you're going to get. <laughs> I'm not, God's not going to answer your prayer. Your, the reward for your prayer will be people might be really impressed with you, but God is not impressed. The Father is not impressed with that kind of prayer. So he's not impressed with how loud you can be and how showy you can be in prayer. That's what Jesus says. So he tells them, don't do that. Instead, so he paints this picture of this kind of extreme thing. 
which by the way, it sounds like maybe this was something that was done in some settings, but Jesus wasn't necessarily attacking a particular practice. Actually, this would have been very abnormal for someone to stand on a street corner and pray like this. So sometimes we read this, we think he's, he's talking about something specific, but he's painting this extreme example to say, here's what you shouldn't do. And so what he does instead is paint this other extreme. Here's what you should do. You should go inside your room, close the door, and pray to your father as you are unseen, you should pray to the Father who is unseen. And then God will hear and he will see your prayer. And there you'll actually get the reward. So instead of praying for everyone to see you, you should instead go into your room, close the door, and, and instead you should pray to the one who is unseen. You should be unseen yourself. Now, this is a ridiculous kind of extreme because the reality was in the first century, most houses did not have rooms where a person was like their room. Like in our house, the girls have their own bedrooms. I have uh, my own bedroom with Jen. Like we have our own rooms and we close the door. And, but that was not the case in the first century. Usually you didn't have that many rooms in a house and you certainly didn't have your own room. Like that was, that's a very kind of Western new concept. And if there were rooms, there were not doors most of the time on there. What Jesus is actually talking about is actually a storage closet in a house where things that weren't meant to be seen and put in public were actually put inside a closet and the door was closed. And this is kind of a ridiculous scenario because nobody would go and pray to God in that closet. This would have been unheard of, basically. So Jesus is saying here, instead of doing something that everybody can see and that's totally for show, I want you to do the extreme opposite. Go to a place where no one will see you and in a place that's obscure and you will only be seen by your heavenly father. And then you will actually get your reward. So picture kind of the, the most um, kind of ugly hidden place in your house. For us, it's the crawl space in our house. And picture Jesus saying, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go into your crawl space and pray instead of being outside for everybody to see you pray. It's kind of this ridiculous kind of like polarization, what he's saying. But he wants us to see that what really matters is our connection to the Father, not what everybody else thinks around us. He doesn't necessarily mean that we don't ever pray in public. Jesus clearly prays in public many times. So he doesn't mean that we should never pray in public and that we should only pray kind of on our own, like we would talk about in our, in our prayer closet uh, or in the secret place. So he's not saying that that's the only place you ever pray, but he's saying that should be kind of the overall posture of your prayer is to pray kind of for an audience of one. So he says, first of all, don't pray like those people. Secondly, he says this, don't pray like the pagans who babble on and on. So don't be like people who just kind of keep using words to try to get God's attention. So in the, in the Greco-Roman world, that's what Jesus is talking about here when he says pagans, uh, it was very common for people to use very specific wording when they prayed to God and to use lots of words when they prayed to what, whoever their God was to try to manipulate and convince the gods to do what they want to do. And the kind of the general belief was if I use the right words and I say them enough, God will have to listen to me and he'll have to do what I say. You know, most of the religions of the ancient world were all about manipulating the gods, bending them to our will. Um, it's very interesting. A Christian, Judaism before Christianity is one of the only religions in the region where there is never a sacrifice or an offering demanded to get God to do something. It's really interesting to think about. All of the offerings in the Old Testament, the whole sacrificial system, all of that stuff is all in a response to what God has already done. Whereas the rest of the religions in the world around us were all about make these sacrifices to get God to do something. It's a very different kind of scenario. So Jesus says, that is not how your father in heaven operates. Actually, how he operates is you don't have to convince him to do things for you. He already knows what you need even before you ask it. And that's a very different kind of way than praying the rest of the way uh, the, the world around a place. He says, look, and the problem here 
The reason why you're doing this, this hypocritical kind of thing or this pagan kind of prayer is because you don't know who your father is. So Jesus repeatedly talks about his father in the prayer. And then he begins to shift to actually praying. And what he does in shifting to actually focusing in on the prayers, he says, look, I want you to know who your father is. Who is the person that you're actually praying to? Because if you know who the person is that you're praying to, then you'll know how to pray and you'll know what should be your priority in prayer. Now think about this just for a second. If you, uh, maybe you've ever, this has ever happened to you where you met someone and you didn't really know her and you had a conversation with someone and you really didn't know who they were. And later on you found out who that person was. And if you had had that information at the beginning, you might've had a different kind of conversation with that person. Uh, This happened to me a few years ago. Um, A a pastor friend of mine invited me to this uh, a little breakfast with someone he was really looking up to, this guy named Alan Scott. Now, Alan Scott is a pastor uh, now on the West Coast in California. He was a pastor in Northern Ireland and has become a real spiritual hero of mine. Like, I mean, just a guy who I just, uh, I just love his heart. I love his passion. I love, uh, I love, I just love the way he leads. There's so much that I feel like I've gleaned from this guy. Well, my friend Kevin invited me to go to this breakfast where this Alan Scott guy was going to be there. And I had never heard of Alan Scott, didn't know anything about him. Uh, I showed up a few minutes early and, uh, and I'm standing in the parking lot. My friend Kevin shows up and this guy gets out of the car. He's a very unassuming, small, kind of slight guy. Um, and uh, honestly, I just thought, oh, here's this guy that's just coming with Kevin who is, uh, who is just a, a friend of Kevin's. As I meet him, I realize he's got this Scottish accent. And I was like, oh, that's really interesting. And he was just like very kind and unassuming. We had a short little conversation about where he was from and where I was from. He opened the door for me, offered to get a cup of coffee for me, like as we walked in the door and we were just chit chatting. And then within about 10 or 15 minutes, I realized, oh, this is this Alan Scott guy who, again, who I didn't know anything about. Now, what I know about this man and the influence he's had on my life and really the life of our church, even though you don't know, I would have had a very different conversation with Alan knowing now what I know about him. It would have changed the tenor of our conversation. I would have been hanging on every word. I would have been paying closer attention. And I think that that's what Jesus is getting at here, that you can have a relationship with God, this prayer kind of relationship. And it's going to change and it's going to shift if you really know who God is. If you don't know who he is, you're going to be the kind of person that prays for show. You're going to try to win everybody else's attention when you really only need to be winning the attention of one. Or you're going to be the kind of person that tries to manipulate God because you think that that's the kind of God he is. And Jesus says, no, that's not who he is. And so he says, here, I want to introduce you to who my father is and how to actually pray about him. Now, look, as we talk about prayer, I want you to take out of your mind the idea that prayer is primarily just about asking God for stuff. Because when we think about prayer, most often we think about prayer is just asking God for stuff. I want him to do stuff for me. I check off the box. I've asked God for what I want, and that's the end of it. That's not really what prayer is about. Actually, you'll see if you really break down this prayer that Jesus has and you look at the life of Jesus, that prayer is actually about connection and communion with the Heavenly Father. It's actually about spending time with someone the same way that you spend time with your best friend, the same way you spend time with your spouse, the same way that you spend time with your kids is the same way the Father in Heaven wants to spend time knowing what's on your heart and sharing what's on his heart with you. So I want, I want us to think about what prayer is just slightly differently as we get ready to talk about this. So he says here, here's how, you're, how you should posture yourself in prayer. So Jesus talks first. He says, our Father in heaven. Our Father in heaven. Now, this has become so familiar to us, this way of praying, that we don't think about how radical this idea is to talk about God in heaven as our father. Now, other religions of the ancient world, they did sometimes refer to God as their father, but it was a generic way of talking about how God is the creator of all things and cares for all things. Even within Judaism at the time, they believed that God was the father of the special people of Israel, 
But Jesus, the way he talks and the terminology he uses actually narrows us in. So we know Jesus isn't just talking about the God as a father in general or in a generic sense. He's saying, no, he is my father. I have an intimate, dependent relationship with him as a father and a son has. And so we have to to lean in and think about that Jesus here is introducing us to something pretty radical, that when we pray, we're not praying to a far off God who's distant and removed. Instead, we're praying and coming to God as a child comes to their father for things they need. So think about this. A child knows what their father is like. They, there's intimacy. There's a sense of connection there. There's dependency. A child comes to the father in a state of dependence. I need you. I need your help, right? My kids come to me all the time. Daddy, can you help me with, right? He's saying, that's exactly what your posture should be. Come to me like that. And then there's an obedience factor because sons obey their fathers. At least they're supposed to anyway. And so when Jesus says, pray to our father in heaven, he's saying you should come like a child who has a deep connection, who has dependency, and who is willing to listen to whatever this father has to say. And so therefore, here's what we would say about this, that the father can be approached and prayer should be approached relationally as a father approaches a son. So here's the first kind of little note here that you'll have is that the posture of prayer is relational. The posture of prayer is relational. Prayer is not about trying to manipulate the gods. It's not about doing a religious duty. It's not about performing magical spells. That's what sometimes people think about with prayer. Uh, It's not about performing in front of God. It is about connecting with our Father relationally. It's about coming to the one who says, I want to know what's on your heart, and I want to share with you what's on mine. And prayer... As Jesus knew prayer, I want you to hear this, doesn't work any other way. (laughs) Like the way that Jesus prays and says the way that we should pray is that we should pray with a sense of relationship building with the Father, pursuing knowing God and being known by God. And I will tell you, I'm just going to be really honest. I'm going to admit, I'm going to like, I'm going to get more, more and more, um, kind of zoned in with some challenge here as we go, that if you approach prayer, any other way than relationally, you will be disappointed. You will be disappointed because it won't produce the results in your life that you want it to. You won't experience the transformation in your life that's meant, that's meant to happen. Uh, that's just not the point of prayer. If, If you'll be frustrated because you'll, you'll, you'll think I said the right words. Why didn't you do the thing I wanted you to do? And that's just not the point of prayer. The point of prayer is to approach our father in heaven from a place of need, from a place of dependency, from a place of obedience to approach our father relationally. So the first thing is the posture of prayer has to be about relationship. The second thing is, he, Jesus says this, he says, hallowed be your name or holy is your name. God's name in the Bible has to do with God's reputation. So for example, when you think about someone like Martin Luther King, when I say that name, what comes to your mind when you think about that person? Or when I say the name Michael Jordan, what comes to your mind when I say that name? When you hear the name Donald Trump, what comes to mind for you when I say that name. When we say a person's name, there are ideas that come into our mind, that come into our head, that are really all about that person's reputation. So when Jesus says, hallowed be your name, he's praying this kind of prayer. He's saying, Father, I pray that when people think about you, I pray that they think that you are holy. They pray that I, I pray that they think that you're holy. What, what does that mean? It means that when people think about his father in heaven, he's saying, God, I want those people to know how good and moral and perfect you are. I want people to know how you are completely uh, other than anything else in creation, that there is nothing like you and there never will be anything like you. I want people to know that you are completely other, that you are holy. That is what he's saying. So holy is your name. So what's the point of that? If he is holy, and if Jesus is saying we should approach the Father in heaven as though he is holy, it means that we're going to approach with a sense of reverence. So I'm not just talking to my best buddy. 
I'm not just talking to my best friend. He is that, but he also is something completely and totally different. When you pray, you're not just talking to your dad here on earth. You're talking to the most high and holy God. And here's where I want us to zoom in for a second. When you speak to God in heaven, yes, you're speaking to your father. Yes, it's intimate. Yes, it's close. Yes, it's connection. Like, but you're also speaking to the one who breathed in, breathed you into existence. He is the one who sustains all life and holds all things together. He is the one who is in charge of where the stars are aligned and where the sun goes and where the moon goes and whether things grow or don't grow. It is all under him. He is holy. So the posture of prayer has to also be reverent. The posture of prayer has to be reverent. He's not just our best friend, he, although he is that. He's not just our father. He is that. He is our holy father. We have to learn how to hold these things in tension. This is a crazy mystery for us to think about, that we could call on God as father, which, by the way, was scandalous to all of Jesus' contemporaries. All the people who knew Jesus said, how dare you talk about our God? like that because they knew they knew God was holy. They knew he was totally other. They knew that he was completely different. And so they had a, a strong sense of holiness, but they didn't have that strong sense of intimacy and connection with the father. See, but we can go the other way where we lose that, 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 that strong sense of holiness because we are pursuing that sense of intimacy and that sense of connection. But Jesus says, no, actually we cannot exclude being both relational with our father and reverent with our Father. And actually, I would say that I think that this is a real challenge for most people. We have a tendency towards either being in this relationship with God or being of kind of having this reverent respect or fear for God. But the truth is the posture of prayer, the way we approach God has to be both uh, relational and reverent because he is our Holy Father. It's not an either or, it is a both and. And again, this is just the great mystery of our faith, that a holy God, someone who is perfectly good in every possible way you can think of, would want to have a relationship with me as someone who has so many flaws, someone who is so far removed from that, whose knowledge is so limited, my understanding is so limited, yet a God wants to know me and have a relationship with me. So we have to make sure that we hold when we approach prayer, understand who it is that we're talking to. My dad and my mom every once in a while when I was young, when uh, I would kind of um, be mouthing off about something, uh, they would say something like, who do you think you're talking to? As a way to remind me that our relationship was different, that I can't just take it so casually. In our relationship with God, while we can be honest and authentic, we can pour out our hearts and our lament to God, we should never forget that he is both, he is holy and that we have to approach him with reverence. Reverence doesn't mean afraid. It doesn't mean that everything has to be perfect in order. It doesn't mean we can't speak our mind, but we know that our words carry weight before God. That when we come before God and ask him of things, that we're approaching one who is completely good, who is totally other, yet wants to know us and be intimate with us in in every way. That, that should cause us to, to, to be sober-minded when we approach prayer, but not to stay away from God. Sometimes that's what people think that, that reverence thing means. I'm going to keep God at a distance. I'm not going to know God. I'm not going to walk in friendship with God because, because I know he's so holy, because I know he's so good. And that keeps us actually from walking in deep relationship with God. But that's not what we're meant to do. We're meant to walk in relationship with God, but walk in reverence with God. And we see this throughout the Psalms. If you go and you read all the Psalms, you're going to see places where like someone like David, it seems to know God in a way that I can only dream of knowing God right now. He seems to like have this kind of real deep connection with God in heaven. Yet at the same time, like the scripture I wrote or I, I read right here at the beginning uh, of, the, of our live stream, uh, where God is like high and lifted up. He's holy in majesty and splendor. That's the same person knowing that God, and that's how we're meant to walk too. So that's the posture of prayer. There's a priority of prayer in our life, though, that Jesus reveals. There's this first thing that we should be pursuing in prayer, and everything else fits underneath it. Everything else follows that. Jesus, when he prays, 
Hallowed be your name. Make your name holy. He was revealing to us what his priority was in prayer. Because before he asked God anything else, before he, before he asked his father to do this or to do that, his first thing is, God, make your name holy. And that should be our priority too. Whatever else Jesus says, whatever else he talks about in his prayer, it's in the context of God, as you answer these prayers, would you make your name holy? As I come to you and I ask you to provide for me, to forgive for me, to guide me, as we're going to unpack in the next couple of weeks, I want your name to be holy. I want your name to be revealed. I want your reputation, uh, your holiness to be made known at all of the earth. And church, I have to say that this is a missing priority for most of us. This is a hole in our relationship with God. Most of the time we approach prayer simply from the thing that we need from God. God, I need you to do this. I want you to do this. And if, if we give any thought to God's reputation, any thought to God, I want people to know you, I want people to know who you are, it's second at best if it's there at all. It doesn't seem like most of us are, um, are, are given to much thought about God's holiness being known on earth, his glory being made known on earth. Most of us are just concerned with God, just answer my prayers, just do the thing for me that I need. But the truth is, in every prayer that Jesus prayed, he was pursuing the glory of God. So when he prayed for a sick person to be made whole, it wasn't just that that person, it wasn't just for compassion, that was a part of it. It wasn't just for the love of that person, that was a huge part of it. It was so that God would be glorified. Jesus repeats this refrain over and over again when he prays for people. This happened so that God would be glorified. This happened so that you would know my father. Even on Jesus' darkest day when he is, doesn't want to go to the cross, not my will, but your will be done. Father, I want people to know who you are in this circumstance. And there is just no way I could possibly reveal in words how important that is. But I am telling you, church, that we've got to shift our posture in our prayer life so that we are praying or thinking, God, would you let yourself be revealed? Would you let your holiness be revealed in this situation? Would you let yourself be known? Would you defend your reputation so that the world would really know you? That has to be an important part of our prayer life. As a matter of fact, I have a conviction that if we will pursue the priority of making God's name holy, of, 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 of asking God, would you let people know just how incredible you are? If we prayed that way and made that our first priority, that many of the things that we seek and ask God for prayer, many of our requests in prayer would actually be answered before we even ask. I think because this was Jesus' posture, there was no heart, there was no conflict between what is God's will in the situation and what should I pray. He knew what God's will was in the situation because he was pursuing God. How do you want to be revealed in this situation? How do you want to be made known, Lord? Now, I know that that's a like kind of an out there concept. <laughs> Most of us have not thought a whole lot about that. I know I haven't. But I'm telling, that if, telling us that if our priority can shift to, God, make yourself known in the world, that our prayers will begin to actually not get smaller, but get bigger. That we'll actually see the different ways that we should be asking God to show up in certain situations. Not just because we need him to or because we want him to, but because the world needs to know who God is. God's reputation is on the line through his people, representing him here on the earth. And so when we pray, God, hallowed be your name, make your name holy, we're, we're praying more than just God do something. We're praying, God, would you let us reveal who you are to the world? And we need the church to do that more than ever. Right now, there's a world watching the church for so many different reasons. There's so much turmoil, there's so much frustration, there's so much chaos going on in the world. We need to represent God well, and this has to be the prayer of our hearts. God, make your name holy. Let people know just how kind and beautiful and, 
uh, compassionate and loving you really are. What does it look like for God's name to be made holy? What does it look like for that prayer to be answered? Just to, let's just take one that's a hot button right now, racism. When people hate someone or mistreat someone because of the color of their skin, because of their status, because of their class, for any of those reasons, it's more than just an offense to that person. It's actually an offense to the image of God. And when followers of Jesus do that, it's even worse. We're actually defaming the reputation of God when we hate other people, when we look down or despise other people, whether it's for racism or for, for any other reason. It's actually any dehumanizing thing that we do actually is an offense to God's reputation. So when we pray, God, let your reputation be upheld, we're saying, God, would you let us value other people the way that you value them? And would you let the world see our compassion and our love and our peace? Would you show who you are through how we treat other people? When God's people sin in any capacity, it actually it is, it's an offense, not, not just to, to, to God himself. It's actually an offense to the world. They say, what kind of people are you? We think about how many times Christians have been judged as, judged as hypocritical and saying, God, you, you Christians say one thing, but then you do another thing. When we pray the prayer, God, make your name holy, we're not just praying that he does something. We're actually praying that God does something in us. God, would you help me to glorify your name? Let your name and your reputation be lifted up through my life, through what I do. God, don't let me, when I pray this prayer personally, don't let me bring any shame on your name. God, don't let me bring any disrepute onto your name. Bring glory to your name through me. Let your reputation be elevated. When we pray this prayer, hopefully what will happen is our actions in our life will reveal who God really is. That when people think of the name Chael, hopefully, my, my, my deepest prayer is that when they, when they hear my name, they think of how good God is. Not because of how holy and good I am, but because how I've lived my life to point people to what it looks like to have a relationship with Jesus. I think that that should be the aim of all of us, that when, when they hear your name, when your name comes to mind, they actually think not just about you, but they actually think about how good God is. And I'm going to say, man, we're, we're, we're really far from that in so many ways. I think that God's calling us to a time where we actually value his holy name being lifted up in the earth. That God's calling his church to a new place of worship, a new place of proclaiming just how good and glorious he is. I think that our focus for too long has been simply on our circumstances. And what God wants to do is shift our perspective to just our circumstances and what we want him to do for us here and right now. To God, let your rule and reign come here on earth here as it is in heaven. So the priority of our prayer life, everything that we ask God for, the context in which we ask God for it, is God, let your name be made holy. When you answer this prayer, let people think about how good you are. When you do this thing in my life, let people think about how compassionate you are. That has to be our priority. So our posture is both relational and reverent, and our priority in prayer is all about God's holy, holy name, about his reputation. So a couple questions here to kind of wrap up. When you pray, who are you praying to? Do you know the God that you're praying to as your father? And do you know that he is holy? Who is the, who is the God that you're actually praying to? Because if you're approaching God as someone to manipulate and try to convince to do something for you, uh, and you don't know him yet as father, I've got good news for you. He wants you to, he wants you to know him as your father. That's how he wants to know you. He wants you to understand and know what it's like to be in a relationship with him, to have that kind of friendship with God, that son or daughter relationship with God. So I know that. I know that for sure. If you're the kind of person who approaches God casually, he wants you to know his holiness. 
He wants you to pursue him in a new way where you have reverence and awe for who he is, where you live your life with a sense of wonder. You want to live life with wonder? Know who God is. So when you pray, who are you praying to? Maybe it's time for just a little bit of a tune-up there, for just thinking differently about who we're praying to. And then when you pray, what is your motivation in prayer? What's your priority in prayer? Is it just a laundry list of things that you want God to do? If so, that's okay. That's a good starting place, but that's not our ending place. Our ending place really should be, God, as you do these things, would you lift up your name? Would you let your reputation be on display in my life? So I hope that, I know that this is like not the most practical thing, but when Jesus and his disciples come to him and they ask him, how, how should we pray? And when he tells his disciples here how they should pray, he doesn't just give them all the rote things that they should do. He actually gives them a way to reframe how they approach prayer. And that's what I want for us. I think that's what God's heart would be for us, that we reframe how we approach prayer. And so if you can just begin to just approach God as Father and approach God as, as holy, in a new way, then guess what? You've taken some steps towards a deeper and more intimate relationship with God. If you can begin to begin to even just think about what does it look like for his name to be made holy, then you're going to move into praying like Jesus. And when we pray like Jesus, we'll begin to see the prayers answered like Jesus. Actually, Jesus tells his disciples in the passage that we've been studying, John chapter 15, for the last few weeks, that we should ask, and whatever we ask in his name will be done for us. Well, the way that we do that is praying like Jesus prayed. We want to pray in his name. It's praying like Jesus prayed. Let me pray for you really quick about that. So, Lord, I just pray for my friends today. I pray that they know you as Father and that they know you as Holy. I pray that they grow in intimate knowledge of who you are, God, both as, as friend, as savior, um, as, as their beloved, Lord, but I also pray that, that they grow in knowledge of you as holy and completely other. And God, I pray even now that there would be a, um, uh, a sense of conviction, a sense of reverence that fills people's minds and the hearts as they think about approaching you in prayer so that they aren't just going through the motions of prayer. They're not just throwing words up at the sky, but they're approaching a holy God who wants to know them, Lord. I pray they would approach you in a completely different way. I pray, Father, that you would reveal yourself to people in prayer. And I pray, God, that you would help people to see the ways that you want to know them, the way that you want to minister to hearts, God. It's not just about them coming to you and doing something for you, God, but you actually want to bend down low and listen to our hearts and bring your peace and your calm into our hearts. So I pray that you begin to do that even now, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that we begin as a church to proclaim your name as holy, that your name would, and your reputation be, would be defended by our actions, by our worship, by the way that we give, by the way that we serve, by the, by the way that we interact with one another. Lord, that your name would be made holy through Fusion Church, that, God, that your name would be high and lifted up in Wakanda and Island Lake and the surrounding areas, God, because of the way that we treat you, because of the way that we talk about you, God. I pray that you would forgive us of any offense, Lord, against your heart, God. Any way that we have casually approached the Holy One of Israel, the Holy God of the universe, any way that we've been too casual with that, oh God, we just repent of that, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that you would, God, that you would just meet us in this place of contrition, that you would meet us in this, this posture of saying, God, we're sorry, Lord. And that, would, God, would you begin to show us who you are, reveal your glory to us, God. Reveal who you really are to us, Lord. And reveal who you really are through us, you do that, Father. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This week, there's going to be a couple things that are going to happen. First of all, in your discovery group, or I'm sorry, in your community groups, you will be discussing some topics related to this message. So I want you to be prepared for that. That's going to happen over the next six weeks or so. In our community groups, you'll be discussing kind of the topic from these different messages. Secondly, you're going to have an opportunity to actually practice praying this way in your neighborhood. So each week over the next six weeks, you're going to get some directions for how to do a prayer walk in your neighborhood, specifically 
specifically focusing on each aspect of prayer that we're talking about. So I wanna encourage you to look at the beginning of the week, Monday or Tuesday, for that. And I would encourage you, whether you're an individual or family with little kids, to engage in this process. We're gonna make it as simple as an, and accessible as we possibly can. So if you've never done this before, I promise you this will be the easiest thing you will ever do, just to learn how to pray, not just for ourselves, but pray for our neighbors. And if you don't have a neighborhood, then we, we're asking you to adopt a neighborhood, pick a place to go and pray and to do a prayer walk. And so watch out this week for those things. They're going to help us and reinforce the things that we're learning together. And if you have a family, if you have little kids, we encourage you to engage in all of this together with them and let this be something that you pursue as a house. Remember, we want revival in every home. And that starts with prayer. So God bless you. God be with you. God keep you safe this weekend. I hope to see you really soon. Take care.